good evening. In a special program this week, I'll be talking to Pierce Brosnan, the man who should have been James Bond, wasn't James Bond, and finally became James Bond. He's a highly personable 44-year-old Irishman who now speaks with a cunningly developed all-purpose accent and who, in a movie career that began in 1980, has suffered at least his share of professional and far more painfully personal setbacks. Today, as the result of an overnight success that took him a mere 15 years or so to achieve, he's among Hollywood's leading stars and will be seen at the end of the month in the disaster movie Dante's Peak. It was to discuss that, James Bond and other matters, that I flew to Los Angeles to talk to him. Look, I don't want to talk out of turn, but I think you should call a meeting and put this town on alert. There's a hell of a lot of activity up there. Harry, I know it was intense up there, but I don't want to cause a panic over a few minor tectonic quakes. Minor? The biggest one we measured was 2.9. I don't give a damn if it was a one. Harry, one. those quakes were shallow. Paul, damn shallow. I was up there. I felt it. Harry, you and don't... They weren't tectonic. They were magmatic. This thing is going to blow. Harry, I'm warning you. I'm not going to have one of my people scaring the hell out of everybody because of guesswork and hunches. Another 48 hours will tell the tale. You get a grip. Pierce, Dante's Peak seems to me to be a very significant movie for you because I think it's the first time you've had your name above the title in a, in a really big, mm. big budget picture. Mm. Is that right? Well, it comes on the heels of Goldeneye. I mean, yeah. Goldeneye was very significant, but Dante's Peak is significant in the sense that it's a $100 million budget movie, mm. which is no small change. And as you say, my name is above the title. And uh, I have entered into a zone, I guess, as it were, with that. I, not that I want to carry on doing event movies or huge, big budget movies like that. But yes, it's very important. It's very important that it was a success and there was a lot at stake. So what was the appeal then of Dante's Peak? Uh, was that part of it, that it was a big movie and your name was going to be above the title? What was the appeal of it? Well, I've always been... I love the Poseidon adventure. I love Towering Inferno. I grew up on these movies. And when this came along, Roger Donaldson is a good mate of mine. I've known him for a number of years. He's a good filmmaker. And I hadn't planned on doing anything during the summer, really. I was looking for work. I was looking for, for something to do. And he said, I'm working on this movie called Dante's Peak. They want so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Big A-list yeah. guys, players who have been out there, tried and tested. But he said, I'd love to do it with you. And I said, well, let me have a look at the script. I read the script. I liked it. And I said, yes. I mean, if it's, if it's going, I'll do it. OK. Here we go. And it's opened well, hasn't it? Yeah, here. it's opened. Yeah. I mean, it's it's opened really. that must be a relief, always. Oh, big relief. Oh, yes. Because there is trepidation attached to it. I mean, if, if, it, if it dies, <coughs> you're in big trouble, aren't you? Well, there's trepidation in, in going into a movie like this, where you're at the mercy of special effects, you're at the mercy of digital domain, you're at the mercy of so many unknowns, and also you're at the mercy of a $100 million budget. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, a that's, a, that's a burden to carry around with you, isn't it? I mean, are you aware of that all the time? Jesus, no. this is costing $100 million. I've got to be no, good. Not at all. I mean, I think the producers are. The, yeah. the, the studio were. Um, I think for me, the actor, you really just have to go to the text and pay attention to what you're doing as the, as the actor within the structure of the story and try and make it as real and as honest and as, and as exciting as possible. But um, every now and then you'll, you'll read the trades, which is really every now and then. I don't read them that much. Somebody puts one in, my, in front of yeah. me and you go, oh my God, a hundred million dollar movie. Yeah. And that will kind of <laughs> make certain parts tighten mind. up, <laughs> so to speak. Your life has, has 
changed very much for the better in the last few years, hasn't it? <clears throat> I mean, what, what was, was that getting finally getting to play Bond? Has, has that made the big difference to you? Bond has made a big difference. Yes, absolutely. I mean, prior to Bond, I was thinking of selling the house. I have a lovely house in Malibu. It's six acres. That's a big old nut, mm. you know, to pay for. And uh, I thought I'll cut my losses. It's and I'll really just concentrate on a film career. And I'd been doing Mrs. Doubtfire, I'd done uh, Love Affair. So I was slowly beginning to kind of build up a career in the movies. I noticed that you, uh, over the last few years, you, you've played a lot of what, for lesser actors, would have been supporting roles, but for you, of course, it would be um, cameo parts right. in, in, in big, high-profile movies. That was important, was it, J to be there? It didn't matter how good or bad the movie was, it was important to be in it. Well, I'd said to... I'd done a TV series, Remington Steel, and Remington Steel was, I mean, put me on the map here in this country, and which I'll be forever grateful for. It allowed me to have a career here. But then I had to, I was stuck with a certain image within that, and every actor gets stuck with an image. But I had to fight pretty hard to kind of get out of it. And I'd said to my agents, I said, look, I want to work with the best people possible. I want to work with the best scripts, the best directors, the best actors. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a three-page scene or a six-page scene or two scenes, three scenes, as long as it's significant to the plot, to the piece, <clears throat> just so I can work and so I can work with the best. Because um, I came to this country, you know, 15, 16 years ago thinking I was going to work with Martin Scorsese and I was going to work with, and I got a TV series and it was Remington Steele and it was wonderful and it was a great learning process. but. That was a big gamble, wasn't it? Because I, did not you and, you and your late wife, Cassie, <coughs> borrow £2,000 to come out here mm. to see, see what you could do? We did. It didn't give uh, yourself much time. I mean, even then, the early 80s, £2,000 wasn't going to keep you here long, was it? Oh, God, it was a lot of money, though, actually. I mean, it was only for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, covered, it covered two you, weeks. You weren't coming here indefinitely on 2000 no, 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 quid. No, 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 not at all. I'd done a miniseries called The Manions of yeah. America, and when that came out, we were plotting and scheming, and Cassie said, we should go to America. And we just bought this large house in Wimbledon. And I said, well, how do you intend to do this? So we took out a second mortgage on the central heating, got on Freddie Laker, came over, and uh, found an agent, and went around Hollywood and got Remington Steel. You stayed with that for, what, six years? It was actually four and a half years. Oh. It just seemed like six. It just <laughs> seemed like six. Fourth season, it got canceled. Uh, they drew the line across it, no more. Bond came around. I, w I was touted for Bond, and uh, th what had happened was there was a 60-day clause in my contract mm. to NBC, actually to MTM, and then to M uh, NBC. And within those 60 days, Cubby Rockley, the late Cubby Rockley, and my agents set up the negotiations for me to do Bond. We'd done the wardrobe fittings, we'd taken the photographs, all of this was done down at uh, Pinewood. And the clock was ticking, 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 and we were assured that I was going to get out of Remington Steel. And then NBC said, we'd like the option of 22. Well, no, Cubby, actually, Cubby said, look, you, you can have him for six episodes, but no more than six, mm -hmm. then he's mine. And the clock ticked, 57, 58, 59, 60. They said, NBC said, we want the option of 22. Cubby said no, and that was it. You must, you must have been seriously cheesed off, weren't you? I was, I was pretty gutted by the thing, mm. because you, you felt so manipulated, and it was played out in the media. And Bond, there's always such a, a ballyhoo about the next James Bond, and quite right, too, you know, because it's, it's tradition, it's an institution, it is what it is. So, yes, I felt pretty annoyed. It actually was a delayed reaction. Yeah. About six months later, I was driving down PCH, and I was thinking of the possibilities that could have been, might have been, yeah. and, uh, you know, I was hearing about Tim doing it, and so just, phew. Didn't you hate Timothy Dalton at that time? No, it was nothing to do with Tim. It wasn't personal. I mean, it was business, purely business, and that's, and you have to, you learn that pretty quickly in this town, and greed. And greed, yeah. It was greed from NBC because they well, wanted everything. They thought they were going to have, you know, a yeah. TV star and then an international film star. So 
You cut your losses and you move on. But do you think it's worked out for the best that you didn't get it then? Because it's, it's what, best part of it, 10 years later when you finally played the part? I think back then, 86, it was, it was quite overwhelming. I think secretly there was a relief that I didn't get it. And yet the world knew that I was the man that they wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and within that came a kind of its own curse because wherever I went in the world, people would say, oh, you were the guy that was going to be and should have been and could have been and might have been James Bond. <laughs> In the mythology that has built up about you now, now, that, now that you're a star, there's a story that when you were 11, you went to the movies and you saw a Bond film and you said, my word, I want to be an actor. Now this, this sounds too serendipitous to be true, is it? It's really, it's, it was the seed of wanting to be an actor. I didn't say I wanted to be an actor, but um, in 64, I left Ireland, came to live in London with my mother and my stepfather. Uh, it was in Putney, and the first weekend there, we went to the movies. They took me to the movies, and it was Goldfinger. And so as a boy, having been brought up in Southern Ireland, in, in Navan, County Meath, there was the Lyric and the Palace Cinema, and it was Old Mother Riley and Norman Wisdom. <laughs> and that's what I was brought up on. So to see this incredible movie, this Technicolor film, you know, and film. this... <laughs> And this beautiful blonde lady, half naked on a bed, was captivating. But more, more Bond, the Bond character I didn't relate to. I, I, odd job was fascinating, you know. You and fancied that, yourself as odd job? Well, as odd job, Hurling yeah. bowler hats. Bowler people. hats. Yeah. Well, no, just as a boy, you know, <laughs> yeah. just the gimmick of the whole thing. Yeah. And so that was that weekend. And then the following weekend, it was Lawrence of Arabia. Bond crops up intriguingly in your life because isn't it true that... Um, that Cassie had a part in one of the Bond films, and with the money she earned from that, you bought your first house in Putney. Is that mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So you were obviously exactly. fated to pay Bond sometime or other. Couldn't escape it. Couldn't escape it. Couldn't escape it. We bought the house in Wimbledon, which uh, you know my mother and father now live in, and uh, she had just done for your eyes only. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had been out of work for a couple of months. I just finished a run in the West End. She got the job. It was wonderful because she was the breadwinner then. Went off to Corfu and that was my first encounter with the broccolis. Yeah. Cubby at that time was most gracious to Cassie, the children and I, and Barbara and Cass became good friends, Barbara Broccoli. <coughs> we joked about my being James Bond, never thinking in a middle, million years that it was ever gonna enter into my career. And at that time, there were, I got a job offer for the Manions of America, which was a six-hour yeah. miniseries. They were looking for this guy to play in this miniseries. I got that. And so with the proceeds from both jobs, we bought the house and then decided to go to America. Which of your predecessors as Bond did you like best? Connery. Connery because he was the first man that I saw yeah. in 1964. He, and then, of course, I consequently went to every James Bond movie. So I grew up with Sean's work. And, uh, but I, I, I cannot let it go by so readily without saying Roger, 
because Roger then I saw come into the role as as Bond, and I remember, I remember all the the articles being written then about you know well he's not going to be Connery, he's not going to be this, but Roger made it his own, you know, brilliantly so for for seven films. And they, well, they said the same thing about you when you got into it. You know, is he going to be Connery? Is, is he, he going to be as good as yeah. Roger? Yeah. So I, I mean, I knew going into it that those comparisons were going to be made, and I don't think in '86 when I was offered it, I don't think I would have risen to the task as I did. Yeah. There. Well, at least you were compared with, with Connery and uh, and Roger, not with George Lazenby. Well, that would have been that would have been uh, a bad day, <laughs> really. Poor George. I don't think it was George's fault. I just think he got the short end of the wedge there. Really, I think in those days there were. They didn't know what they had in their hands. And it really, you, you cannot underestimate this role, you know, the role of Bond. Oromos, we made him a general. He sees himself as the next Iron Man of Russia, which is why our political analysts rule him out. He doesn't fit the profile of a traitor. Are these the same analysts who said the Golden Eye couldn't exist? Who said the helicopter posed no immediate threat and wasn't worth following? You don't like me, Bond. You don't like my methods. You think I'm an accountant, a bean counter, more interested in my numbers than your instincts. The thought had occurred to me. Good, because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. How long do you think you've got in the role? How, how long would you like to, to do it? I mean, do you, do you put any kind of limit out and say, I'll do two th films, three films, four films, or what? Well, they've got me for two more. Number 18, yeah. which is coming up, number 19, and then there's an option. And I would just like to leave it at that. I'd like to honor my contract and then just move on. Tell me something about Bond 18. Is, is that what it's going to be called, Bond 18? I or think, or I, are they still trying to figure out, a, well, presumably they're still trying to figure out a title for it. They're just trying to figure out a title, but Bond 18 is not a bad title, actually. No, it, think it, it tells it like it is. It often. tells it like it is. It has a certain kind of minimalist quality to it. Um, <laughs> Bond 18, it's, well, we have Jonathan Price. He's the heavy, isn't he? He's the heavy. Yeah. And we have Michelle Yeho, who's this female Jackie Chan. Uh, she's a uh, kung fu artist, beautiful woman. Is she Bond's girl or Bond's? Actress? She's on my side. Oh. Yeah. It's always useful to have somebody like that on your side. Exactly. <laughs> and that's as much as I'm allowed to say, I think, Barry. Really? No, you can't even tell me what the story is. Wow, this is very hush hush. It's well. Um, I don't, no one has said it's hush-hush, but I think they like to keep their cards close to their yeah. chest with this. I mean, eventually the story gets out. Oh, of course. But yes. you're not going to hear it here. I think I'll let it, let it come from someone else's lips. A few years ago, when 1991, um, Cassie, Cassie died. Um, I mean, obviously this must have been one hell of a boat. How, how, do you, how do you cope with that, you and the children? Because you've been very close family, haven't you, all together? Well, we're very close. Um, still very close. It's, it's something which takes time to get over. Yeah, and course. it's, you know, when someone gets cancer in a family, when a, when a wife or woman gets something like ovarian cancer, not going to be specific, it's, in her case, it was, you know, four years of, of living and living with death and dying and the possibilities of it and trying to survive. So it's taxing. It leaves you emotionally drained. It leaves you um, fairly adrift somewhat. And you have to kind of be easy on yourself. No, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yes, it has been difficult. Yeah, because, I mean, one got the impression that, I mean, she was obviously a very, very supportive person, that in a sense yours was a joint career, that you were both working towards making you into the star you now are. Mm. Um, and she wasn't quite around to see, see it all work, was she? It was sad in that sense. She would have loved this time in life now. She wanted so much for me as, as a friend, as a partner. And um, she loved the whole the Hollywood aspect of show business yeah. and knew how to handle herself in this town and knew how to take it with a pinch of salt. But, um, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. Because I, I would imagine that, I mean, getting there to the position you're at at the moment <coughs> is not easy. But when you're there, I would think the pressure gets even worse. 
I've felt the pressure now since, you know, since Goldeneye. Suddenly there is so much work. Your profile has gone up. You're uh, really center stage, so to speak. And um, success makes it more, it makes it easier, but it also makes it more difficult because you have to uh, keep up, stay up, stay abreast of, of your past success, so to speak. And um, I'm just coming to terms with that. Yeah, I mean, how, how, how do you come to terms with it? What do you do about it? Do you, do you then set up your own production company and make your own movies, um, commission your own scripts? Yes. Yeah. And that's what I have done. I set up last Christmas, Christmas before last, I set up a company called Irish Dreamtime. And we made our first film at the end of last year, right on the heels of Dante's Peak. Called? It's called The Nephew. And you're, you're in it as well as producer? I'm in it. And we have a wonderful cast. Donald McCann, Sinead Cusack, Neil Tobin, and a wonderful young actor from uh, New York called Hill Harper. So yes, I mean, it, again, the success has allowed me to do that, to set up my own company. I mean, I had a production deal about six years ago under the auspices of Dawn Steele when she was at mm -hmm. Columbia. And, but it went nowhere. And I went in with ideas and ideas, and they went nowhere because I didn't have the clout. Now I have a bit of clout. There's a certain bankable quality here to me because of the bond cachet. And you take advantage of that, and I take advantage of that because, you know, the bond will pass. And I would like to have a career where I'm mixing and producing and maybe directing my own work. And it must be nice to have clout. It is. It is. Of course it is. And, um, but are you conscious that it can uh, go as, you know, as oh, swiftly oh, as it came? Absolutely, in the blink of an eye. You know, you make a few false moves, and uh, that's why I don't feel like I'm an A-list actor, I suppose. I don't feel like a movie star, I, whatever. It's just an actor, just a working actor. Um, but um, it's all good stuff. <laughs> it could gonna, be worse. It could it? be worse, <laughs> and I yeah. enjoy what I'm doing, you know, enormously. How do, how do they feel about you in Ireland now? Do they still regard you as an Irishman? Because you don't sound. When did you lose the accent? You <clears> don't sound <throat> Irish anymore. Um, well, the accent comes back. The accent. Uh, when you're there. When when I when I'm there, it comes back. And I lost it because well, I lost it in '64 as a boy, you know, coming from somewhat the bogs of Ireland, so to speak. And I went to this large, comprehensive school in South London. And mm -hmm. being Irish in, a, in an environment like that is is tough. It was tough. It was difficult for me. They, you know, you you are made to feel Irish. So, yeah. in order to fit in, I developed a kind of Cockney accent. You know, and then slowly the Irish accent fell away, fell away, and this kind of London, South London came in, you know, all like that, and then suddenly I decided to be an actor, and then it got very posh, you know, and then it became so mangled I didn't know who the bloody hell I was, you know, and finally America came, and I always had this kind of mid-Atlantic twang, I suppose. So if I'd remained in England, I was either going to be playing Irishmen or yeah. quasi-Americans, so thank God for America, came at the best time, and now I end up playing Englishmen. What was the appeal of Mars Attacks? Was it, I mean, uh, a curious role anyway, I'm a curious movie, but was it the, the, the people involved, the cast, the it, Jack Nicholson's and all those others? It was, it was, it was Tim Burton, really, because I was the first one to sign on, yeah. uh, so I was told. Tim Burton, I just think he's a unique filmmaker on the landscape of cinema. Uh, I love his vision and the way he tells his stories. And, so I'd read it, and I liked the character, I liked him, we had a meeting, and then my agent said, no, wait, 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 there's going to be someone big in the role, maybe, maybe Warren Beatty, maybe Paul Newman, I waited a week, and the second week came, and I said, look, to hell with this, I just want to work with Tim Burton, you know, I don't care who else is in it, really, um, and lo and behold, it was Jack Nicholson and the rest of the players. It's a good cast. It's a great cast, yeah. a great cast, I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry it didn't fly as high and as wide as I thought it was going to. Sir, Mr. President, I know this seems terrible, but let's not be too rash. We should nuke them now, sir. We must establish a line of communication first. Why not set up a town hall? We can get the public's opinion. What do you think, Marcia? Kick the crap out of them. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This could be a cultural misunderstanding. So where do you get from here? What, where, where, what lies in the future, do you think? Well, Irish Dream Time, I have two other projects with United Artists. One is a remake of the Thomas Crown Affair, and another one is, uh, it's a story which is close to my heart. It's a, an idea of mine. It's called Mr. Softy. It's the story of a 50-year-old teddy bear. <laughs> and I have a wonderful writer involved in that, Anne Spielberg, who wrote Big. Ah. And um, so those two projects I would really like to see fly. So do the Bond and do either Thomas Crown Affair or Mr. Softy. That sounds all right. It's not bad, is it? No, it's, it's not, not bad. bad. So you're not, gonna have, you're not going to have to sell the house in Malibu just yet? Don't have to put the for sale sign up yet. <laughs> nope, no governor. <laughs> all right, I can pay the rent. They haven't found me out yet, thank God. It's always that fear, isn't there? The one always, day oh, gee, we always. want it all back. It's been a mistake. Yeah. Oh, constant. Absolutely. Well, Bond 18 is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's and hope uh, that day never comes, no, because no. when they say we want it all back. Hopefully not. God willing. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much. Cheers.